everyone. Welcome to today's Protocol Labs Research Seminar. Today we are joined by Pratush Tafari, who is a third year PhD student at Johns Hopkins University under the supervision of both Matthew Green and Abhishek Jain. Uh, his fo research focus is on problems at the intersection of cryptography with privacy and verifiable computation. And he has also co collaborated with the Ethereum research team to build, attack, and study practical verifiable delay functions. And with the PSE team as a grantee, where he went down the zero knowledge proofs rabbit hole, working on verifiable machine learning. Today, he's here to talk to us about his paper on algorithm substitution attacks on cryptographic uh, puzzle puzzles. Over to you, Pratish. Thanks a lot, Liam. Hi, everyone. I'm Pratish. Uh, today, we will be talking about algorithm substitution attacks on cryptographic puzzles, and this is a joint work with my advisor, Matthew Green. Uh, so let's get started. Backdoors are not something that's new. They've been around for many years now. In the early 2000s, uh, there were backdoors uh, which were put in by computer worms such as Sobic and MyDoom. And what they would do is they would install a certain piece of software which uh, you would not know about on your computer. And the goal was that the spammers then who install this software can send junk emails from the infected machines. Uh, this actually led to a crazy uptick in email traffic in the early 2000s. So, and it would work so that as soon as you received an email from an infected machine, your machine would get infected itself. Other than software backdoors, there are also hardware backdoors that we've heard about, uh, where manufacturers of hardware devices have messed up the design somehow or put in some uh, root access that they shouldn't have ideally because they don't own the machine once they sell it to a certain degree, right? Then there's also cryptography backdoors, which is kind of the focus of this talk uh, and how it affects certain puzzle problems in the real world. And these puzzle problems are very relevant to blockchains. A few years ago, there was a big backdoor that was discovered in a primitive uh, for deterministic random bit generation called dual EC that was approved by the NSA, but later uh, people found backdoor attacks which were possible, right? So very exciting stuff. Uh, so what are the different ways in which people can backdoor cryptography? There are many ways. So in cryptography, we have these keys which are sensitive objects, uh, similar for cryptocurrency wallets as well. If you lose your keys, then you lose access to secret information or access to a wallet. And so this information has to be protected and the keys need to be strong. What that means is that if the key space is too small, people can brute force and find attacks. There might be other sophisticated attacks depending on the cryptographic primitive you're using. But if the keygen algorithm is weakened, then that doesn't help at all, right? Furthermore, if you are using a cryptographic primitive and it has certain fixed backdoors, uh, fixed parameters, they, they can lead to a backdoor. And this is what happened in the instance of dual EC. If you knew the backdoor, then you could very easily find out more information than you're supposed to about keys, which might apparently seem to be randomly generated. Uh, but for someone with a backdoor, they can predict that key much easier than just sampling randomly and trying to find a collision. This sort of malicious design of algorithms leads to apparent secure security where someone using it might think that the algorithm that they're using is perfectly secure and there's no problems, but the person with the backdoor, meanwhile, can read or break the secure, read their messages or break the security of the protocol. Right? All these objects in cryptography which give us security come from the fact that there is a lot of entropy in cryptographic systems, which means that your key is, let's say, like a long bit string. If it's long enough and it's actually random, which means it has high quality entropy, then no one can just guess and find out what your key is, right? But if you reduce this entropy, uh, then you get in trouble. So our goal in this work is to see uh, with the uptake in hardware devices used, being used for cryptography, we have certain manufacturers which are uh, manufacturing these hardware devices or puzzle solving devices, as we will call it. Uh, and the, these devices can be thought of as mining devices. Now people are looking at 
zero knowledge provers, which would be hardware based and verifiable delay function hardware. These are all puzzle primitives and we group them as such. And we want to look at whether these hardware manufacturers can backdoor these devices so that they sell these devices to a certain honest party and then the honest party invests resources to solve the puzzles but the malicious manufacturer who backdoored these devices reaps the rewards. So let's look at what these cryptographic puzzles are. Right? So the concept is very similar to puzzles in general, right? In any puzzle instance, uh, you, you get the input or whatever the puzzle is, you solve it. And if you solve the puzzle, you get a reward, right? So Cryptographic, cryptographic puzzles are very similar, but they have a resource requirement, which is kind of guaranteed, right? So if you're someone who is solving the puzzle and you don't invest the amount of resources as specified by the puzzle maker, then the probability that you will solve the puzzle successfully is negligible. As an example, if you look at proof of work, uh, this is computation. So this means that on average, you need to calculate a certain number of hash functions before you find a proof of work solution. Uh, then we have verifiable delay functions, uh, which say that if you solve this puzzle, then it must take you a certain number of seconds. And the way this is uh, emulated in a protocol is using computational cycles, right? So each device can have certain number of computational cycles in a second. And if your protocol takes a set number of computational cycles to complete, then you can uh, emulate wall clock time using it. Right? Similarly, if you look at proof of space, then you need a certain amount of disk space to be able to find a proof of space solution. Right? And certain puzzle uh, protocols are bad for the environment. So if you look at proof of work, uh, it uses a lot of electricity, uh, almost as much as uh, small-ish or medium-sized nation at this point. So slowly we can see different protocols moving away from proof of work as Ethereum did recently. More formally uh, and concretely, we can look at cryptographic puzzles as the following algorithms, right? So you have a setup algorithm and what it does it, it decides the puzzle difficulty, what your resource requirement is, what your resource is. It also decides an input domain. Uh, for the puzzles, right? So let's say I want to make a puzzle. What I'm going to do is I'm going to run the setup algorithm according to my choices, and then it's going to give me an input domain to uh, select my puzzle instances from, right? And once I have this input domain, I can sample puzzle instances randomly. Then of course you have the evaluation algorithm uh, in which the puzzle solver generates a solution uh, and a proof. Uh, certain protocols, split this apart into two different parts. So it's the evaluation itself uh, and the proving. And so, but we group them just together. So you, you take a puzzle instance, you solve it, you get a solution and a proof which you can verify through the verify algorithm. Um, so the verify algorithm would take the solution, the proof uh, and the input and other public parameters and it'll check whether the solution is correct or not. Let's look at different applications of puzzles, like why should we care about these, right? So in the beginning, client puzzles were first used to solve uh, denial of service attacks. So if you have a server uh, which performs a certain high quality activity or you want to prevent a service from running for properly, what you can do is you can just overload them with connection requests. And as, at a certain point, the server will get overwhelmed and the service won't be able to run properly anymore. Uh, to solve this problem, Jules and Brainard in, uh, at NDSS in 1999 uh, proposed something called client puzzles. Uh, this means that if you want to send um, a connection request to a server, first you have to do a certain amount of work or solve a puzzle. And once you do that, then you can send the request successfully. And then what it meant is that to run a denial of service attacks, uh, the cost to run any such attack now increases massively. Right, and so it kind of prevents these attacks, or at least it increases the overhead of the attacker so that the attacker would need a lot of resources to run such an attack. The most relevant uh, application of puzzles to the, the audience here would be consensus in blockchains, right? And in consensus, we just, we have a certain uh, high reward task and we want to perform uh, 
we have different parties which are ready to perform it and we don't know how to select which one right and so for this we have various consensus algorithms uh, which are basically utilizing certain type of causal constructions right uh, so if you again like like we talked about there's a resource requirement to solve the puzzle and that changes so in proof of work it requires electricity or computational steps um, proof of space requires disk space etc right and a lot of these puzzle solvers are hardware based so whether this be uh, asics or fpgas or zpus so a lot of bitcoin mining is done on asics uh, yeah, and there's other other like things like Litecoin and I think Dogecoin. They also use ASICs. There's different proof of works which use GPUs and FPGAs. Uh, so the key issue here is that you have a very high state application, right? You're uh, engaging in this puzzle solving process, and the first party that solves the puzzle it reaps a lot of rewards, right? So the goal for any such attacker comes sort of naturally, right, to attack such a protocol. And we will look at what this means later. Right? Uh, so algorithm substitution attacks on cryptographic puzzles, right? So what is the first part the algorithm substitution attacks or ASA means, right? So the setting here is that you are using a certain cryptographic algorithm. It has uh, some security and privacy properties, right? But the hardware or software implementation that was provided to you uh, was provided by a potentially malicious party, right? And so can this malicious party break your crypto? So whether it is breaking the security or privacy or some other guarantees relevant to your protocol, and can they go undetected while they do so, right? And so a similar concept was first introduced as kleptography by Young and Young at the crypto conference in 1996. Uh, and in the seminal paper by Bellare, Patterson, and Rogovic, they they looked at symmetric encryption and backdooring symmetric encryption using ASAs and different game-based definitions for this. And a lot of the follow-up works actually build on these game-based definitions. Uh, so now there have been ASA papers where people have looked at different secure messaging applications uh, like Signal. Uh, and they study whether algorithm substitution attacks are possible on Signal. Uh, there, there's been at least five to 10 very solid papers in this space now, which uh, deal with different scenarios. Uh, there's also the Crypto 2018 paper on correcting subverted random oracles uh, by, I think, Russell et al. And, and they look at the fact that given a subverted hash function, can you... Uh, convert it into an implementation which is actually not subverted. This is kind of similar to our work, but we aim at a general puzzle-based definition and we'll show some interesting analysis, uh, attack techniques, etc., and also countermeasures soon. So let's take an example from the BPR paper from 2014, and this is for symmetric encryption, right? So for the cryptographers here, uh, you have your symmetric encryption scheme, which has it has like a certain key, and you're trying to communicate to another party. And they call the malicious party who's providing the implementation the big brother. So that's what the BB is here. So in the normal operation, you are communicating using symmetric encryption. You have a certain key, and anyone who sees the ciphertext which is the thing that you transfer to whoever you're trying to communicate to, they won't be able to find out any information uh, about the content of your message, right? But in the subverted operation, what happens is that since your implementation is provided by a malicious party, what they do is they add, they hardwire an extra key inside it. And what this does is this malicious operation now seems benign to any other party other than the big brother, but when the big brother sees the ciphertext, only they can actually find out what your message is. So they find out what the content of the message is while both the communicating parties thinks, think that they're using a secure protocol and the big brother can go undetected, right? But puzzles are different, right? It kind of seems like there's no secret here to leak, right? So what, what would an attack here even mean? Uh, in terms of encryption, it's very clear that if the 
the con the whatever your message is if that information is found out by an adversarial party then uh, you're in trouble or if your secret key is leaked then your protocol completely breaks down but why how do how is this relevant to puzzles right so in most puzzle protocols uh the attacker or the subverting adversary that's the person who's malicious and they design the puzzle solving hardware or software right and let's say uh, the honest party, which is called the detector or detecting adversary, buys this puzzle solving machine, right? And now this honest party invests resources to solve the puzzle. And the attacker wants to subvert the puzzle solver such that they the, the subversion actually benefits the attacker, right? And the detector does not find the subversion. And how it actually benefits the attacker, we'll see soon, right? Uh, but in the Let's look at this in the context of blockchain consensus, right? So you have a certain task to be performed, the party performing the task gets a reward. And so we have to decide which party, right? We have multiple willing parties. And most protocols, regardless of what consensus algorithm they use, they decided in the following way. They pick, they pick randomly, but proportional to investment, right? So if you look at a solution that use that uses proof of stake uh, plus VRFs or VDFs, uh, people stake a certain amount of uh, uh, token, whatever your token is. And depending on what their stake is, a random lottery is picked where your probability of winning is actually proportional to how much you've staked, right? In proof of work, uh, this is still true because the more number of mining devices you have, the higher your investment and the higher of your chance of solving the proof of work right and so in in a certain sense the, the randomness decides the winner and in most settings the winner there's only one river and winner and they reap the reward right which is uh the block reward for bitcoin and other proof of work things uh so the asas on puzzles would aim to attack this exact process right so if the process to decide this randomness that picks the winner is if the attacker can affect it, then they can reap rewards uh, more than their investment, right? Here's a nice image from ledger.com that tells you how puzzle-based consensus works. It makes most sense in the proof of work setting. So you have your network server, right? And there is a puzzle which is decided to be the puzzle for that block, right? And that's sent out to a bunch of parties which are willing to solve the puzzle, right? And all of them attempt to solve the puzzle. They send solutions. The party here, X2, which solves the puzzle correctly, gets rewards, right? And this puzzle solving actually is done in hardware in many processes as we looked before, right? Let's take proof of work mining as an example here, right? To solve these puzzles, you first need to buy hardware, right? And here's like an example of what are the different hardware this is just a screenshot from a popular hardware manufacturer. This is what these devices look like, right? So you can see uh, the amount of investment here might be okay for a, for a big corporation, but for individuals mining, it, it's a pretty high investment. Uh, these devices also consume a lot of electricity and so they're expensive to keep running. And the hope is that you win rewards, which are fair, right? So proportional to your investment. Before we dig deeper, here's a quick overview of the Bitcoin proof of work, right? So there's a proposed block and it has a block header, which is the SHA-256 hash of the block header. Uh, then any miner would decide the transactions that they want to include in the in a block that they would propose. So they would build a Merkle tree using SHA-256 for uh, these transactions. And they take that, the previous block header, and the proof of work is to, with those two inputs, find a nonce such that when you hash all of this together, you get a hash with a certain number of preceding zeros, right? And that decides the difficulty for that block. And the miner that achieves this successfully and in most times in fastest gets the block reward, right? So I think the current Bitcoin block reward is 6.25 Bitcoin, which is over $100,000. And the hardware consumes a set amount of electricity every hour. 
and it just turns away, it just keeps incrementing these nonces to find a solution. Uh, and you can either mine by yourself, so you do the whole exhaustion of the nonce by yourself, or you do it in a pool. So then in the mining pool, what happens is there's a pool operator, right? And they orchestrate this process. So let's say uh, your nonce is whatever your nonce space is, right? Whoever is in the mining pool, the pool operator would divide the non-space among the members of the pool and everyone would work on their shares or their work shares, right? So that's their set amount of puzzle input that they have to exhaust, right? This is an important statistic right here, right? So if you look at the hardware manufacturers for Bitcoin, a few of them, there's roughly three or four which manufacture most of the devices, right? And you will see why this becomes a problem later. Uh, the main issue is that the biggest, uh, the two biggest mining pools are also run by the people who manufacture these devices. So they have a lot of control over the device that they make uh, and sell. And after they sell the device, they're still communicated to the to these devices potentially using their mining pool, right? So if you look at Bitmain, which is the biggest manufacturer, they manufacture two thirds of the devices. Uh, and they control uh, the two historically biggest mining pools as well. Uh, the situation is changing slowly, but it has been the case for at least the last 10 years. Right? Okay, enough about proof of work, right? So in, in, in cryptographic puzzle manufacturing, let's say there's a malicious manufacturer, what are their goals, right? Uh, so you can see that these protocols are being used in consensus and other activities where solving the puzzle gives you a reward. And your expected reward is proportional to your puzzle solving activity uh, ability, right? So as an attacker, what I want to do is I want to lower other people's puzzle solving ability, right? Because the puzzle solving ability is always represented as a fraction of the network, right? So if you own, let's say 10% of the network's devices, your puzzle solving ability is 10% of the network. Now, if I make, let's say, half of the devices go away, which are not mine, then my puzzle solving ability certainly doubles, right? So now it goes from instead of 10%, uh, it goes up to a 20%, right? So it's always respective to the rest of the network, right? Uh, and in the best case scenario, what I want to do is I, I just want to take other people's solutions. So they do all the work, they do the investment, and I just reap the reward, right? So there's two main angles for the attacker goals that we're considering here, which is you lower other people's puzzle solving ability and increase your fractional puzzle solving ability as a result, or you try to exfiltrate other people's solutions, right? So in this, in this blockchain based setting, let's look at the threat model, right? What's the threat model here? So first one is the direct input model. And in the direct input model, uh, what happens is you have this malicious pool operator who also made your device, right? And that's why the image I showed earlier, uh, right here, becomes very relevant, right? Because the person who's operating your pool also made a lot your device with high probability, right? So this is a realistic set, threat setting and it, it ha it's happening right now. It's been happening for many years. The other one is the blockchain input model, right? Here you're sort of either mining individually or you've joined a mining pool, which is uh, not operated by the person who manufactured your device, right? So in the direct input model, they can talk directly to your mining device through the mining software because they made your device and they also run the pool. So they made the, uh, so they communicate directly with your device. In the blockchain input model, the malicious party may have made your device, uh, but the only way they can communicate with your device is through the blockchain because your device is reading information from the blockchain. Uh, so they can indirectly try to affect the information on the blockchain and that would affect what goes inside your device, right? And so why does this become relevant, right? And the way it becomes relevant is we look at a couple of attack strategies that we have. So the first one is the load shedding attack. And so what the load shedding attack does is it load sheds uh, attack devices in the network, right? So what this attack would do is it would lower the puzzle solving ability of the attack devices every once in a while, right? 
so you can think of it this way, right? You have a device that you bought from a malicious manufacturer and there is an input domain of the puzzles uh, that your device tries to solve, right? Now, what the manufacturer does, it, it hard codes certain bad or trigger inputs within the device. Once the device sees any of these inputs, uh, it's just going to perform at it at a puzzle solving ability much lower than advertised. Uh, and the reason it's interesting to look at it in this way is because if out of the box, the devices didn't perform as advertised, then people would just be like, I received a defective device, there's an issue with this, right? But if you have an input trigger, which sends the device into bad mode uh, for let's say two days or something like that, right? What the malicious party's goal then becomes to trigger the device once it's online, right? So your device is performing perfectly well, and then it sees a certain input and after that it its performance declines for a little bit, right? And so what happens is any person who buys such a device, if they try to test it at home, it would appear to be working properly. There's no issues at all. And then the device goes online and every once in a while it performance declines a little bit, right? And so it gives this sort of like plausible deniability to the manufacturer, the effect doesn't seem negative enough for uh, the honest party to cause a big issue. They might just be like, okay, like there was a small issue with the device, but it's working fine now. And the attacker uh, continues to reap the rewards because for every few blocks, uh, every once in a while, their puzzle solving ability is just going to grow that much. And we'll see a quick analysis for that. So in the direct input model, this attack is very effective, right? And the reason for that is, uh, in the direct input model, the malicious party who made your device can communicate to it directly because they're also your pool operator. So if they want your device to go into bad or triggered mode, what they would do is they would just send you a trigger input because that just looks like a hash for most proof of work, right? Uh, and as soon as you input this information into your device, it's going to go into bad mode, not puzzle solve uh, with the ability that's advertised. But in the blockchain input model, this attack is not so effective, right? Because uh, if your input is coming from the blockchain uh, and that's a certain hash, then it's very challenging for any attacker to get us exact certain hash to be the next block header, right? And so we also explore a stateful variant of the attack. In the stateful variant of the attack, the mining device, which is subverted, keep state over, let's say, 100 consecutive blocks, right? And so then the goal of the attacker becomes that they have to uh, affect the entropy on the blockchain so that over the 100 consecutive blocks, uh, a certain function of the block header is a triggered input, right? So instead of them trying to uh, get the next block header to be a certain hash, now what they do is they try to affect the entropy on the blockchain little by little every block. Uh, and they, if they own a, a good enough hash rate, it doesn't have to be too high. Even if it's 10%, they can mount this attack. And the analysis is available in the paper. This is an interesting graph that we plotted. And this basically on the x-axis, you have the percentage of devices subverted by the attacker, right? So there's two to three different manufacturers uh which are making over each of them make more than 20 percent bitmain makes two-thirds so it's like somewhere here uh and they make these devices right and they subvert these devices and let's say they sell them subverted right uh and let's say they also take part in the mining process themselves and they have a certain hash rate right so if i have a 10 percent hash rate uh and i make half of the other devices just go bad, my hash rate goes up from 10% to 20%, right? My effective hash rate. Uh, and you can see this plotted for uh, different attacker hash rates and different uh, percentages of subverted devices. And so what is this selfish mining threshold here? Uh, selfish mining, uh, for those who don't know, is, is an attack where let's say in proof of work, you are one of the miners and you find the next proof of work solution, uh, but you don't advertise it. 
the reason you don't advertise it uh, is that you just keep working on this proof of next proof of work solution to build the fork of the chain. And if you have enough of the network's hash rate, you can actually build a successful fork so that you mine a bunch of consecutive blocks and other people's solution, which might be a little bit behind, are never chosen at all. So they waste their effort and you mine consecutive block rewards. Um, and the other people don't have a shot at all because you keep your chain private until you know for sure that your chain would be the fork that is selected, right? And so uh, from the work of uh, Eyal and uh, I mean Gunsirer, we know that the selfish mining threshold is one third. So you need to own one third of the network's hash rate to mount a selfish mining attack. But now what we get from load shedding is that if you sell subverted devices, even if you have 20%, if you have 20% of the hash rate and you subvert, let's say 40% of the devices, then you cross the selfish mining threshold and you can selfish mine. Uh, and this is, this is actually the case in possibly in the real world, because there is a manufacturer which has roughly 20% of the hash rate and they make more than 40% of the devices. Uh, so we we can we cannot say for certain if this is happening already, but the it is certainly possible. The second attack strategy is leeching attack, right? So in the leeching attack, the goal of the attacker is to exfiltrate puzzle solutions uh, every once in a while, right? So you can think of this again as an input based trigger where uh, the attacker tries to send a bad or trigger input to the device. And once the device sees this trigger input, the next few solutions it finds, it'll try to exfiltrate them, right? But what does this exfiltration even mean? The device is not, it's not always directly talking um, to the attacker, right? So there is actually an exfiltration channel here. So look at the setting where your pool, man, your pool operator also made your device and they're malicious and what the communication that happens between the mining device and the pool operator uh, is certain lower level difficulty proof of work solutions as well, right? So let's say like the real world difficulty to find a solution for proof of work is uh, 64 bits of preceding zeros in the hash, right? Uh, when you're in a pool, only one of the members of the pool is potentially going to find a solution every once in a while, right? So how do you give people rewards for mining? How do you like spread them sort of democratically? What pool operators do is they consider these lower level difficulty solutions. So while you're trying to find a hash with 64 preceding zeros, you'll find a lot of them with 30, 40, 50 preceding zeros. So what pool operators do is they select one of this lower level difficulty as the, as the work reward kind of thing. And then depending on how many of these you find, they find out what fraction of the hash rate is owned by you and how much work you're contributing to your pool, right? What you can do here is uh, the attacker would hardware the device with a secret key, right? And it then it's going to try to input a trigger to it. And in the attack state, uh, the device will try to exfiltrate the cipher text of the actual solution that it found at the actual difficulty level. And the way it would do it is that it's going to encrypt that solution first, and then it's going to submit low level difficulty puzzles uh, so that at a certain bit for each uh, puzzle, you get the cipher text bit, right? And it works in both settings. So you can either do one by one submission of lower difficulty solutions. And in this case, you would rejection sample. So you are going to only send uh, the lower level difficulty solution where let's say the fifth bit is zero, right? And you rejection sample until you find uh, such a solution. And if you're submitting low level difficulty solutions per block, then you're just going to order them so that uh, let's say a certain bit the ordering basically communicates the ciphertext of the actual solution, right? We also model the security games for something like this. So what would that look like? Uh, because having provable security is important, right? We have these attack strategies, but are they, do these attacks actually work? So first we'll need to consider what security even means for algorithm substitution attacks, right? So we look at this subversion game first, right? So in the subversion game, uh, the malicious manufacturer uh, or the attacker is talking to a certain device 
And the goal is uh, for the manufacturer to figure out whether the device it's talking to is subverted or not, right? And it knows that if the device is subverted, then it's going to run a certain subverted evaluation algorithm, which is known to the attacker, right? So the attacker is allowed to query the device on some polynomial in the security parameter number of inputs adaptively, and then the attacker outputs its guess for whether it thinks the device is subverted or not, right? So if you look at the case of any input trigger-based attacks, what the attacker would do is just, it's just going to send a trigger to the device. Uh, and if the device is subverted, then it's going to start performing at a lower efficiency uh, or lower puzzle solving ability and the malicious party would be able to find out if the device is subverted, right? The other security game that's important is where the detector, the honest party also needs to figure out the same thing, right? So the detector buys a device and they want to find out whether this device is subverted or not, right? Uh, so it's the same setting as before, but the detector does not know uh, what algorithm the subverted device would run. It, on, it only knows the, the correct evaluation algorithm, right? So the detector tries to talk to the device on, query it on a bunch of uh, puzzle inputs uh, and adaptively, and then, try, then it guesses whether the device is subverted or not, right? And so if the, if the subversion uh, triggers uh, are like a negligibly small fraction of the entire input space, uh, then the detector would never be able to figure out by random testing, right? Uh, especially with polynomial number of queries. So this we call this the offline detection game. Uh, so you can think of it as you buy the device and you're testing it at home, right? Uh, but another interesting setting is the online detection game. So you say, okay, like my device works fine at home, but does it work in the real network, right? And I'm going to test it. So everything else remains the same, but we add an attacker oracle, right? So what this does is that now not only does the detector talk to the device, it can, what it can do is it can see, it can have oracle access to an attacker and it sends a start attack uh, symbol to the attacker and the attacker would then give it messages to send to the device, right? And then uh, the detector forwards this message to the device or computes a function of it and continues this conversation. And this emulates the setting when your device is online and an attacker might try to mount an attack. And if you're looking at the information that is input to the device and the outputs of the device, can you figure out whether your device is subverted or not? So this greatly improves the detector strength. Uh, so uh, most of our atta attacks actually are not offline detectable. So in most settings, you won't be able to detect at home whether your device is subverted or not. Uh, and as I said, it's very easy for the attacker to trigger the device. Uh, but in the online detection setting, uh, only some of the attacks succeed or have plausible deniability. Uh, because once you see an attack in session, you can kind of figure out that maybe this conversation is what is what's making your device perform uh, negatively, right? And so what are the real world concerns here? Like, fine, we have, we have these like detection things like cryptography games, but how do we detect stuff? Uh, detection is certainly useful, but only if it's fast, right? Because testing and profitability is at odds. There's a paradox here. So let's say you don't trust your manufacturer. And so you're testing your device a lot. The more you test your device, the more your device is online, right? So while your device stays online, other people's fractional hash rate is that much higher. So distrust in the malicious manufacturer actually benefits them, right? And there's also simple timer-based attacks. Uh, like I just put a timer in the device so that it starts failing after a year of uh, being online. And these devices actually have a small lifespan, 18 months until they're profitable, after which you have to take them out, at least in the case of Bitcoin. Uh, and the attacker could only subvert real world difficulty parameters. Since there's so many devices in the network, a single device finds the solution every, every once in a while. So a, a device which is $5,000 would find a solution like 
once a year or if it's operating by itself and like even huge mining rigs with millions of dollars in investment find only solutions in in a few weeks or so right but each solution is over a hundred thousand dollars right now right so we need to study puzzles which are easily testable so that at home i can test it and be sure that it's actually going to be fine in the real world as well right uh, testing also doesn't work because a lot of these hardware devices have hardware errors and they operate within a certain error rate, right? So as you can see for this device, uh, it's puzzle solving ability operates in a plus minus 3% uh, error rate. So as an attacker, I can just always make the device work at its like lower strength uh, and it's still acceptable, right? And let's say your device is exfiltrating solutions or failing on certain inputs it would look exactly like how it looks in the real world with hardware errors. So with hardware errors, what you have is on certain inputs, your device just stops working and uh, on your uh, mining software or portal, it would say that you're, there were a few hardware errors on your chip. Uh, and you say, okay, maybe you know it overheated or some cycles ran out or something like that. Uh, but if I'm an attacker, I would make things look exactly how they look right here, right? I exfiltrate the solution and you just think you had a hardware error, right? And statistically testing uh, your miner uh, with some statistical confidence. So you want, you want to know for sure uh, that with probability higher than 95%, your device is actually subverted. So what you can do is you can try to measure uh, its hash rate over time, uh, depending on like how many solution it find, solutions it finds. Uh, and we have this nice graph that we've plotted. So for depending on the minor hash rate, if you buy a device that's a thousand dollars, it'll take you roughly 600,000 blocks to uh, test, which is a lot of blocks and your device's lifespan will uh, run out before that. So unless you own mining rigs over a uh, hundred thousand uh, dollars, you will never be able to test your devices with high certainty before their lifespan is actually over. So we suggest that people collaboratively test their mining devices to figure out whether they're subverted or not. Uh, we also talk about another countermeasure, uh, which is pre-processing. So certain puzzles allow the puzzle solver to enter entropy into the puzzle sol solving process. And so then what happens is the information that is input to the device is not exactly selected by the malicious party, right? So you can add entropy so that the malicious party doesn't know for sure what would be input to the device. Uh, we model this as a cryptographic game, and this unpredictable pre-processing actually prevents most input-triggered based backdoors, right? You could also mask your puzzle inputs. So you can do an algebraic transformation so that if you have an input X, uh, you transform it to X prime, which uh, the malicious party does not know about. And then your uh, device solves for X prime and it finds the solution, let's say Y prime. And you can unmask the output uh, from Y prime to Y, which is the solution to the original input X before masking. And for algebraic protocols, uh, which have a lot of structure, you can develop these masking protocols. So in our paper, uh, we have a masking protocol for PHAC VDFs uh, and the overhead for masking is very small, so 10 to the negative six almost overhead uh, over the actual VDF evaluation cost and time. And for other algebraic protocols, such as the Wesolowski VDFs uh, and any other puzzle construction which has this structure, you can devise similar masking based protocols so that in the future, if these devices for VDFs are being run in a space where solving the VDF and finding the solution, uh, is a higher reward process uh, than input-based trigger backdoors are not possible, right? So that's it. Thanks a lot. Here's a link to the paper on ePrint. Uh -huh.